Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining this morning. Um, we are going to talk today about uh, the upcoming total lunar eclipse, which happens on the night of May 15th, May 16th, uh, depending on your time zone and, and location. Um, who, who is this uh, webinar for? It is um, really for any any of you who are planning to try to, to shoot this, this eclipse event coming up. Um, hopefully you are somewhat familiar with, with Photo Ephemeris and um, today we'll be primarily using the, well, we will be using the web app, uh, but the data that you see in most of the presentation that you'll see is, is pretty much the same in the iOS app as well. So that will be applicable. Uh, you don't need much knowledge of, of, of how it all works. I'll go through um, things fairly, fairly steadily. So hopefully it will, it will make a lot of sense. So let's have a look quickly at the agenda for today. Um, introduction I've done. What are the goals of, of the webinar? Well, I want to make sure that you leave this session with a good understanding of what, what the phases of a, of a lunar eclipse are, what they all mean. And in particular, for each phase, what, what are you likely to see if you're observing the event and indeed looking to, to photograph it? Once we've gone through that, uh, we'll look at a few different locations around the world and examine how the timing of the, of the event uh, varies by, by your location um, and what that might mean for what shots you would be able to plan. And um, Finally, I've, I've labeled it field of view here in the, in, the, in the goals, but that's just one of the things. There are a few considerations around how to photograph this event that we'll talk through. One, one of them is field of view, which, which we'll cover as well. And then at the end, we'll, we'll do any, any final Q&A and, and wrap up. Um, so let's, let's jump in. So I'm going to start with this, this diagram, uh, which was, is on the Wikipedia page for lunar eclipses. Um, Wikipedia is a great resource if you want to just understand some of the, the science and mechanics behind this event. Um, and they have a few diagrams. This one, uh, it, it's a little bit adventurous with respect to its, its choice of colors, but it does show you um, sort of the key, key events of, of a lunar eclipse. In essence, a lunar eclipse is when the, the moon, and it's basically the full moon, or it's, it's the hours and minutes around the instant of full moon, and it's when the moon happens to pass through the Earth's own shadow. So that you, you may have seen there's a, there's a um, rather well-known uh, tweet from an astronomer, I think called Katie Mack, on, on, who put it out on Twitter a few years ago now. And using emoji, she sort of describes um, what is the difference between a uh, a, a total eclipse where, where you have um, sun, moon, earth in that order, a lunar eclipse where you have sun, earth, moon, so that's the moon in the shadow of the earth, and then the final one uh, goes, how does it go? I'm trying to remember. Well, it's one of the other combinations, and that's labeled apocalypse because if that happened, we'd all be vaporized or something similarly dreadful. Um, so Total eclipse is the shadow of the um, the Earth um, masking the, the the moon, and what happens is uh, you've you've probably seen this in your own homes when you light, put a lamp on in the evening, and you see there's partial shadow that's this penumbral shadow, and there's umbral shadow which is the the deep form of the, sh the part of the shadow, um, where there's no sort of light coming in from from any angle to reach that area. And these uh, P1 is penumbral contact one, P4 is penumbral contact four, and then we have umbral contacts one, two, three, and four, and then what's labeled mid, which is, as you can sort of see visually here, not to scale, I should say, um, is when the, uh, the moon is in the, the deepest part of the shadow of the earth. So that's when the total eclipse is at its most intense. So let's just look here. This is um, a screenshot that I took from Photo Ephemeris Web, and uh, it shows the timeline that you may be familiar with below the map. And it's this is for this upcoming eclipse in May 16th. And uh, I I forget which location I, I grabbed this from, but it's you sort of see all of these events. So time is going from left to right. The further to the right you get, the, the later it goes through the course of the night. And you can see here that these events all happen in sequence. So we have P1, penumbral contact one. That's the start of the penumbral eclipse. 
into partial eclipse, into total eclipse, the moment of greatest eclipse, uh, full moon lands three minutes apart from that. Um, then the end of the total eclipse, that's uh, U3, the um, contact there. Then we've got some of these twilight times creeping in. That's, the, that's when the sun is starting to move out of total darkness and into, into twilight. Um, you may be familiar with these from, from other webinars that, that, that we've done before. Uh, astronomical twilight starts, nautical twilight starts, civil twilight starts, the, the sky is getting brighter as suggested by these, these different shades of blue. End of partial eclipse. And then finally, after sunrise, as it happens here, um, and after the moon is set in this location, the end of the penumbral eclipse. So you can see that um, the, the duration of these events varies. So they're not always the same length of time. Uh, this one is quite a long event. So in, from for, for this data, we're showing that it lasts five hours and 22 minutes from the start of penumbral to the end of penumbral, three and a half hours of partial eclipse and an hour and a half of um, total eclipse. And one thing that gives you a clue as to how long um, the totality is likely to last is, is what's called the magnitude. And the magnitude is most easily thought of as what's the ratio of the size of the, of the, the umbral part of the Earth's shadow to, to, the, to, the, to the moon or what proportion of the moon's surface is, is covered in shadow. And if it's greater than one, then the whole face of the moon is in deep shadow. Um, so 1.4 is, is a fairly, fairly deep eclipse. And this will vary uh, event by event. So if you look at um, other, other lunar eclipses, there's one coming up in November. So if, uh, if during the course of today's talk, we look at a location and we go, well, actually, you're not really going to see it or you're only going to see a tiny a part of it. Um, have a look at the November event and you will likely find that um, you will have a chance to see it in your part of the world then if you don't um, get to see it in May of this year. So then what, what do you see during these different parts of the event? What, what is there to photograph? Well, I'm not really going to talk much about the penumbral eclipse because a, when the moon is in the penumbra of Earth's shadow, uh, it just looks a little bit darker. It's very subtle. It's, it's really quite hard to see. If you casually glanced up at the sky, chances are you wouldn't even know it was happening. The first real visual impact you see is at the start of partial eclipse. And that is when all of a sudden what had been a full moon in the sky, you see a chunk taken out of it. So let's just look at an example of that. This is um, a partial eclipse uh, from I think it was 2015, this one that I took. And you can see this edge of the Earth's shadow. So that is the edge of the umbra. At this point, pretty much all of the rest of it is in the penumbra. And you look at it, you go, well, OK, I wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, to the trained eye, you, you, you might be able to detect a partial penumbra on, on the sun. It, oh, sorry, on, on the moon. It does get a little bit darker, but it's, it's subtle. This is not subtle. It's um, very, very distinct. Um, you're not going to mistake it. And bear in mind that for this upcoming event, the penumbral, uh, the partial eclipse lasts for three and a half hours. So let's just flick back here. In this example, partial starts at 2.27. Total doesn't start for another 61 minutes. So what you would be seeing, um, this is actually, I think, towards the end of a partial eclipse. So the, the the shadow is slipping away and the, the, the moon is gradually being restored to its full size. But over the course of an hour, you'll see the moon eat, eaten away, as it were, um, by, as, it, as it moves into the, the full uh, shadow of the Earth. One thing that might be interesting just to compare, uh, you say, well, how is that different from, you know, a, a half moon, um, the, the quarters of the moon? And here's a visual example. This is a quarter moon. There is no eclipse here. This, all you're seeing here is, is a side-lit moon. So the, 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 the sunlight is hitting the, the moon directly. There's, there's nothing of the Earth's shadow in between you, the observer, and the moon. It's just an effect of the geometry of where you are 
where the sun is, where the moon is, and it's appearing skylit. And you can see here that on, on the terminator, which is um, the, the, the shadow line around, around the surface of the moon, you can see all this nice relief in the, um, in the surface of, of the moon. Compare that here with the partial eclipse. This was earlier in the partial eclipse in that same event in the, in the previous slide. And you see that the shadow line is far less distinct um, you can't really pick up much relief on the surface of the moon. So they are qualitatively different. The, the, the geometry is a bit different as well. So it doesn't, the, the, the curvature is not going to quite match up with what you'd see during normal moon phases. So that's just a little comparison. When we get into, you might be thinking, why, why does it go red here? Um, why am I showing this in, in red? Well, here's, here's what it looks like. This is totality. Um, during uh, a, a lunar eclipse in 2016. This is the, the state capitol building down in Denver here in, in Colorado. And there's the moon in its uh, totally eclipsed state. And you'll notice that, that there's still some brightening on this side of, of the moon. It is still fully eclipsed, but it's creeping towards the edge of the, the umbra of the Earth. And so once it moves out of that, you're back into a partial eclipse situation. And when that happens, the intensity of the sunlight that is reaching um, the, the surface of the moon unimpeded, you, the visual contrast between the area in full shadow and the area in, um, in light in, increases greatly. This red-orange effect this disappears. Um, the, the cause of the red and the orange, it's, it's the same effect that you see it uh, sunrise or sunset, where the light from the sun comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets the, the different frequencies, which correspond to the different colors of sunlight, get scattered differently. And um, the, the light that reaches your eye directly through the atmosphere is what's left is the orange and the red and all the nice colors that we enjoy, sunrise and sunset. And the same thing's happening here. It's the light of the sun skimming through the atmosphere of the Earth, hitting the moon, but it's being scattered along the path, which is why you see this, um, this, this red color uh, is, is the light that, that's being reflected from the surface of the moon back, back to your, your eyes. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that, as I alluded to before, once you go into totality, the actual brightness of the moon is way, way, way less. If you've seen one of these before, you'll remember that it gets very dark. So make sure that you have enough time to let your eyes adjust um, to, to that. Uh, otherwise, you'll be going, I can barely see it at all if, you, if you're stepping out of bright, bright light. Here's another uh, look at how um, the appearance of the moon during totality can vary. This is a composite, so, so the, the, this, it, this isn't a reflection of exactly how the, the moon moves through the sky. These are five individual exposures, which I combined after the, after the event um, in the sequence, and I just put them in this sort of vaguely sort of curvy arrangement. Um, I think, to, to my mind, that, that's fine because I'm not sort of claiming that that's how it actually looked in the skies. Um, you, you will see, uh, likely will have seen shots where people have photographed the whole sequence of, of an eclipse and you see the path of the moon in the sky. You also see composites where there's a wide angle shot. You can see some of the landscape. You may be able to see some recognizable features, but the moon has sort of been pasted into a variety of places. Um, you can do that if you want. I think it's, it's more credible and believable and uh, more impactful usually to, um, to try to reflect what, what happened, which, which you means that you're reflecting the actual path, path of, of the moon. Of course, I would say that because, you know, photo ephemeris, we deal with the precise positions of the, of the moon and sun and the Milky Way, etc. Uh, so uh, that's a composite. And this last one I'll, I'll show you before we jump into the next section. This, is, uh, this was another lunar eclipse. Um, this is taken in Boulder, Colorado, here, here where we're, we're based. And this, the ma magnitude of this eclipse was literally, it only got to 1.0. So it was just a total eclipse. And this photograph is taken as the moon is setting uh, towards the west. So we're looking west here. And it was 
about five, six minutes after the maximum eclipse. So this is the very, very start of partial eclipse. And you, you can probably see that the, it's, the contrast is beginning to get a little bit unmanageable here, um, that there's probably a few blown out pixels right on that top edge of the moon there. And it's also interesting to note, and we'll, we'll come back to talk about this with respect to timings a little bit later, that uh, this was taken during late nautical twilight. So if you recall the definitions of twilight, um, let's say approximately the sun sets at zero degrees on the horizon. It's a little bit below that because of a few different effects which we'll, we'll gloss over today. Um, it, uh, let's talk about it in sunrise. So, so the, you're in darkness, the sun starts rising towards the horizon, it reaches minus 18 degrees. That is the start of astronomical twilight. The sky is still pretty dark. You can see the stars, but you're starting to lose deep sky objects such as you know the Messier objects, the galaxies, Andromeda, those sort of things become less visible. It gets to minus 12 degrees. That's the start of nautical twilight. The sky is getting brighter. Uh, you probably still can't make out much detail in the landscape uh, with, with the naked eye. Um, but you can still see brighter stars and planets for sure. And then you get into civil twilight where the sun is six degrees below the horizon. So this was taken with the sun six and a bit degrees below the horizon. And you can see that it's starting to get a bit bright. So what that tells you is that um, you're gonna have to think about um, how bright is the sky during total eclipse to determine whether you're gonna be able to capture it with any sort of real visual impact based on how dark a totally eclipsed moon is and how bright the sky may be in, in your location. So that's, um, that's that. Let me just check in on Q&A quickly. Um, Don asks, uh, what lens was used for the Denver State Capitol shot? I believe it was a 70 to 300, probably, I don't know, maybe 200 mil thereabouts. It's been that was cropped slightly, so it's not a super long lens. Um, certainly, if if you get um, remember the rule of thumb, if you want a giant moon in your photograph, there are two things, three things you can do: um, have a very large sensor and crop the result down to make it look big. Um, be a long way, juxtapose the moon next to a building, of something that has a human scale that the human eye can recognize and be a long way from it and shoot it with a very, with, with a long telephoto lens. Um, the farther you are from um, your, let's say a building and a moon, the farther away from it you are, then uh, the larger the moon will appear relative to, to the building. It's a webinar on that. Um, you'll see the webinar page. Um, it's on the, the one about shooting with cityscapes and so forth, we talk about that. Greg asks, can, should you shoot with HDR if shooting with a four grand object? Uh, Greg, I, I'm probably going to pass on that one because I, it's been years since I've done any, any HDR. Um, I, the answer is you, you certainly, I think you can. Um, whether you need to, I don't know. Uh, it's certainly a, usually a good idea to bracket your shots. Um, particularly if you're unsure of exposure or indeed if, if exposures are changing rapidly, such as say, you know, this moment where you're coming out of totality into, um, into the partial eclipse phase and the sky is brightening. There's a lot of stuff going on in those circumstances. I think it's always good advice to, to try to bracket your exposures to give you some options in post to ch either choose the best one or, or to maybe, you know, blend if, 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 that, if that works for you. Um, okay, let's move on. I'm going to close Q&A and let me, we're going to switch it now over to uh, the PhotoFamous web app. There we go. Hopefully you can all, all see that. Let me pull up my notes here. So one of the other objectives I had for today's webinar was just to cover some of the um, location functionality within, within the app um, to Cover that. It's not something I've, I've talked about particularly in, in webinars before, but we'll use that to um, show you a few things about what you can do with location uh, searches, safe locations, imports, that sort of thing within, within the web app. And uh, we'll use that to explore a few different um, locations around um, 
around the world. So let's start. Um, I've got the pin dropped here in Boulder, Colorado, but we're going to click here. I'm going to click on the search button and I'm going to search randomly for Berlin. So let's go to Berlin. I type Berlin, brings up a bunch of results. Um, I have the, the paid subscription in, in this account today and th that will give you suggestions as you type. Um, if you're on the free one, just type what you need, hit search or return, and it will give you the results it found, but it won't do suggestions as you type. I click go. We're in Berlin. Now let's get to the right date and time. So you may have seen this feature here. This is an events list. And it's showing here what are the sort of celestial events um, coming up in the month of May. And you'll see here that uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff about the eclipse. Those are the events that I showed you on the slide, but they're just listed in, in this, this events list here. And I will go to this moment of greatest eclipse. Again, if, you, if you're on the free plan, you, you won't see the details around the timing of this event. You'll see full moon, and that's, that's a pretty good guide. Um, if you want the full gory detail, then, then the paid plan will give you that. Let's go to the time of greatest eclipse here. And I choose that, click select. And OK, so now we're evaluating what, what of this eclipse am I going to be able to see in Berlin? And hopefully, you'll, you'll look at it and go, hmm, uh, not a lot. Because two things, uh, I chose the moment of greatest eclipse. But look, here you can see that the moon has already set. So the moon is nine degrees below the horizon. There's moon set. And also, the sun is up. So you, it's not going to be visible in Berlin. OK, that's a shame. What about some other locations? So I'll do a couple of things. Um, before we leave Berlin, I'm going to click onto the locations page. This account has no saved locations at all at the moment. So one thing I will do, I'm going to click Add. And that adds uh, the current red pin, the primary pin location on the map. That's the latitude longitude there of Berlin. And I can give it a name. I can type some notes. And I can click Save. And there's Berlin in my list of locations. Now, when you do this, um, when you sign into the web app, you, you have an account. And, and one of the reasons for having the account is that when you save these locations, they get synchronized to the, the, the server. And that means when you log in on another device or in another browser, uh, you will get the same list of locations under your account. So you can build up your list here. You can filter them. You can uh, um, export them, import them. Let me show you the, uh, the, the import piece. So to import some locations, I click here, uh, and it says Import Locations. Drag a KML file here to import. You may be familiar with KML. Um, it is It stands for Keyhole Markup Language. So I have a file here that I saved before. It's a, I'm going to drag and drop it. There we go. And you see out there it says six locations imported. And here they are. So this was. Uh, a list I just put together to demonstrate this feature. Now, KML files, uh, you, you can export all your saved locations as KML using this button up here. Um, and you can use those to share to other apps, like your GPS app that you may be using, or into Google Earth, Google Maps, wherever you want to, to put them. When you import an, uh, uh, a KML file, you'll see, you might say, what's happened to Berlin? I, I thought we had Berlin, but it's disappeared. That's simply because. Uh, it tags the import with the date and time when you imported the KML, and it puts that into the, the filter field so that it just shows you the, the ones that you most recently imported. If I clear that, then I got the seven back, and there, there's Berlin. So that's um, KML uh, import, and KML is a format you can also export from a variety of other applications. So if you have uh, uh, locations stored in another app um, or in your GPS, you can export them to KML and import them here to use with, with photo ephemeris as well. So let's look at a few other places. Let's go, for example, to Cape Town in South Africa. So I'll go to Cape Town. And 
time of greatest eclipse, still 6.11. Um, and, but this time you can see things are looking a bit more promising and a lot more promising, arguably. We've got sunrise here at 7.30 a.m. We have the time of greatest eclipse at 6.11 a.m., so an hour and 20-ish before sunrise, <clears throat> just after the start of astronomical twilight. So the sky is still very dark. The other nice thing here is that you see the moon is only 16 degrees above the horizon. Uh, you may remember uh, that the moon in terms of its, how it appears in the sky of its angular size, it looks at about half a degree across. And so that means that if it's 16 degrees in the sky, um, in your head, if you imagine, well, if it's half a degree across and it's 16 degrees up, then it's basically 32 moon, moon heights above the horizon. So you might be able to imagine how that, uh, that looks. And if you're thinking that sounds quite a lot, it's true, it is quite a lot. Um, anything sort of 10 degrees and below is starting to feel lowish on the horizon. For it just to feel very low on the horizon, you're talking about two or three degrees. Um, so if we come here to the end of total eclipse at 6.54, but then let's back up, say, I don't know, two or three minutes, so 6.48. Moon's at nine degrees above the horizon. It's from this location. I just chose a point on the bay. It's out over the ocean. So you have totally eclipsed moon in a darkish sky, not entirely dark, um, lowish out of, over the ocean. So that's that's probably a pretty good setup for, for this event. Let's look somewhere else. Uh, let us come to, go to England. Uh, we'll go to Ambleside and Cumbria. Um, and again, this is, we're much further north, obviously, but sort of similar longitude-ish. Uh, but things are not looking so good. We have the total eclipse is starting 10 minutes after civil twilight has started. So you may recall from that shot that I showed you in the slide presentation, which was taken uh, basically a few minutes before the start of civil twilight. You can see the eclipse, um, but the sky is brightening. It's going to be uh, the, the fully eclipsed moon is, is low contrast. So this is going to be very difficult to see. You, you may just be able to see it. So it's again, it could be out over the, over the water here. Um, and there may be an opportunity to, to shoot that, but it's, it's probably going to be challenging. So this, this, these events change based on, on your location. Let's come to Coney Island near New York. Things are rather different here. So we're now back on May 15th. Uh, the total eclipse starts 11.28 at night, three and a half hours after sunset. So you've got dark skies. Uh, it's high in the sky, 26 degrees. Could be worse, um, but it's relatively high in the sky out, out over the ocean here. And the event continues into the early hours of May 16th and finishes in the middle of, of the night. Um, we'll maybe look at one more of these, just as an example. Let's come to, let's come to the west coast of the US. So here's a, a spot up in the hills north of San Francisco. So there's San Francisco, there's Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and let's come back to May 15th. So in this time zone, the whole event happens on the evening of late evening of May 15th, not on May 16th. So be careful of your time zone, check that out. And let's have a look, time of greatest eclipse. This, this is a fairly civilized situation for photographers in San Francisco. The sun has gone down at 8.13. Um, we're into well into nautical twilight. Uh, we're towards the end of uh, nautical twilight here uh, for the time of greatest eclipse. And the moon is relatively low in the sky. So it's below 10 degrees above the horizon. And you can see, oh, that looks interesting. I might be able to catch a fully eclipsed moon somehow juxtaposed with the, the Golden Gate Bridge. So what, what do we take away from, from all of this? Um, you... You definitely need to understand where is the uh, the timing of the eclipse relative to sunrise. That's the critical thing. 
and relative to moon set. If it happens and the moon is set, clearly you're not going to see it. If it happens and the sun is up, that's, that almost by definition can hardly ever happen because think about what's going on. You have the sun, the earth, the moon in the earth's shadow. If the sun is up, well, how, how can that work? In a few very you know, tight, precise circumstances, you can sort of see a partially eclipsed moon, I think, um, when the sun is creeping over the horizon due to atmospheric refraction, but it's marginal. So it's basically not, not, not likely to be something you'll, you'll encounter. Um, even if the sun is down, you need to worry about twilight and how bright is the sky and what phase um, of the eclipse um, am, I, am I in? If you're in a partial eclipse, remember that that is, uh, it, it's relatively bright moon because some of it is only in the penumbra, um, which is only marginally duller than the not being in shadow at all. Part of it is um, in the umbra, so that's like the chunk out of the side of the moon. Even in a, a brightish twilight sky, you should be able to see that okay, and it will photograph quite well. Um, if it's total eclipse and it's low on the sky, then that could be much harder, particularly uh, if there's haze or cloud or pollution. For anything that will reduce the, the, the clarity of um, your, your ability to see the moon uh, will make that more challenging. So one, one th that sort of leads me into one other thing I wanted to show you. Um, KML files. Uh, there are lots of them out there on the internet with some really interesting places. So one set of places that generally has good skies for observing and fits in quite well with the theme of photographing uh, any astronomical event are astronomical observatories. So let me just show you uh, another quick import. I'm going to import this. Here is, uh, let's have a look, observatories. I found this KML with a list of um, astronomical astronomical observatories all over the over, all over the world and uh, it has um, I think it, it, it has sort of prehistorical ones as well so this one is called Hovenweep. Hovenweep is actually a, uh, it, it's not it was thought to be an, an ancient ast astronomy um, for you know people thousand plus years ago when when this place was built and it's out in the wilds of Utah dark skies great um so you'll get a good good view from there so you can search let's say you know you, you you're looking for i like waterfalls i or i like um astronomies i like castles different classes of subject you can often find kml files with a whole bunch of locations out on the internet so you can come to the locations page import them um, look at ones in your area and quickly evaluate what are the chances of of using that location to photograph this eclipse. In this example of, of, of Hovenweep, um, apart from the fact that they probably close it and you can't physically get access to the site because the, it's the national monument um, and they don't like people randomly walking around those at night. Uh, other than that, it would be a, a good good spot to uh, to photograph the, the eclipse. Um, the moon moon is up, dark skies, well, the sunset, etc. Et One more. Uh, location-based thing. Um, you can also look up locations here. So Chaco Culture National Historical Park. That's down in New Mexico, uh, northern New Mexico. And again, lots of good dark skies. You can find these locations in many places, but here on Wikipedia, they give you coordinates. If I click here on the coordinates uh, page, it takes you to this geohack page, which gives you a bunch of links. And I can grab the decimal coordinates here, copy those, and come back to Photo Ephemeris, go to Search, paste them there, and go straight there. So you can use coordinates to find your locations and, and research them, them that way as well. So the one last thing I'll show you on uh, on locations, when I, when I typed in, um, the uh, those coordinates, you'll see it also brought up some other search results for places that correspond to the coordinates. So you're welcome to use those as well. They, they'll, they're likely to be close to the, the coordinates, but not exactly the same.
And finally, this one down here is this service called What Three Words, um, which you may have heard, heard of. Um, it basically assigns uh, a three word name to different um, three meter, 10 foot square um, areas of the earth. And sometimes that's an easier way to think if, if there's a remote place out in the wilderness that doesn't have a name and you don't like using the numbers, but you can, you have, a, you know, these things are a little bit more memorable sometimes. Um, so you can use those too. And you can also search for those and you can save those as, as locations as, as, as well. So that's probably everything on locations that I wanted to say. Oh, the only thing I would say is that these things get synchronized and it happens automatically. You can synchronize up there. Once you've synchronized, if you log into your account um, in the iOS app, for example, you'll get all of these saved locations there. You may have to tap the little sync button, which is this sort of rotating arrows thing in, in the iOS app to, to, to sync. And you can sync, sync both ways. So that's a little sort of detour into some of the location stuff. Um, let me look at some questions here and see if you've come in. David asks, uh, a bit off topic, but I have the iPad app as well. Is there any way to link my pro account to the iPad paid app? My pro login credentials are not recognized when I try to use them to log into the iPad. David, there, there should be. So it's most likely that there is some password issue going on there. Um, you can log in. When you log in in the iPad app, it's exactly the same account and password as you would use on the desktop. So if you're having trouble doing that, it could be, it, it's most likely to be either difference in the email address or in the password. If you're having trouble, please drop us a line of support and I can, I can help you get that result. But the answer is yes, you can log in and you can synchronize uh, your, your locations there too. Jan asks, can you explain the different lines? Is gray moon, does this mean if you look towards the gray line, you see the moon or look away from the gray line? I find the lines confusing. Um, there are a few of them, it's true. And I think people see colors differently as well. So, so I never think of this as gray, I think of this blue. Um, so yeah, uh, let me show you where you can get help on that. If you click help at the bottom right of the window here um, and hit type colors, there's an article here that says, what do the colored lines mean? If you click that, you can either read it straight in situ or you can click this little button and it will open that up here. I see I need to update this, this is from the, the older version of the web app, but the, the, the data is, the, the lines are all the same. Um, so there's, you can find the answers for your reference, future reference Jan, right there in, in the help section. But the other way to read it is that in the timeline here, you see this one says moonset. And some of these panels in the timeline have little color legends at the top. That dark blue there corresponds to this line here. So that means if you're standing at the red pin, looking along this line, that is the direction in which the moon will set. Similarly, this pale blue line here corresponds to moonrise. The orange line corresponds to sunset. The pale one, um, yellowish orange, corresponds to sunrise. And this line here, if, if you watch as I adjust the time of day, uh, let me just do that. That line that's moving, so this one here, is the direction to the moon. So where you would look, you might have to look up a little bit, but you look out from the red pin in that direction at 11 p.m., that's where you will find, find the moon. Thomas asks, uh, yeah, okay. So Thomas, you're asking about the iPad app. Um, how do I view the lunar eclipse bar? Uh, what you need to do is to put the app into night mode. So tap on the date at the top of the screen. Um, you'll see a little mode thing in the, 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 the thing that pops up. Choose night mode, and then you'll see all that information in, in the timeline. And it looks just like you'll see all this stuff. It looks identical, same, same sort of stuff there. Uh, if you can't find it, uh, drop, drop a line and I'll, I'll get, get on to you there. Okay, so we're just left with a few questions on how to, how to shoot this, this event. So let's just talk about some, some of the shot options that you have. Um, we've got, uh, I, I sort of think of it in terms of, I guess, um, four different types of shots that you could, you could take. 
uh, of, of this event. A um, bit of a simplification, but bear with me. First would be a, a, single, a single exposure telephoto shot. So that would be something like, what I might do is I'm gonna skip back to my little presentation. Um, and uh, this, this is sort of one of those. So this was a single exposure. It was with the telephoto lens, probably, I don't know. I think it was set to around 150, 160 mil, not super long, um, but you're basically shooting the moon. Um, this has some landscape in there, but it's not particularly recognizable. This was a composite. So the other one is you can do composite telephoto. So this was with my 70 to 300 at 300 mil. Um, in this particular event, the moon was way up in the sky, 50, 50 degrees above the horizon. So it's pointed high up. And I took a series of single exposures and then put them into this artificial composite um, aft afterwards in, in post. So single telephoto, composite telephoto. Um, you can do a single wide angle shot. That would be just the moon um, with a wide angle lens. You know, let's call that as anything up to, I don't know, 35, 40 mil on a 35 mil camera um, or sensor. And that is typically where you can see the moon in some sort of context uh, next to um, it, above a city, above some sort of landscape. Um, and then you can do a multiple exposure composite which is, I was, I was chatting about before, where you might um, shoot the sequence of, of the full, full eclipse. Uh, it's multiple exposures. You'll choose one of those exposures for the scene. Um, it will have a moon in it, and then you would, in post, uh, pluck out the moons from your other shots and arrange them at appropriate intervals um, to reflect the path of the moon. So those are sort of the four shots, single telephoto, um, let me go here. That's also sort of what I would call a single telephoto. That is one exposure. There's a moon. It's a longish lens. This happens to be juxtaposed next to a, a man-made object um, for visual interest. Um, and you sort of see the playoff of the, the, the orange bulb on the top here and the, the orange moon. So you can do those sorts of, sorts of shots. So single telephoto, composite telephoto, single wide angle, multiple exposure, probably wide angle. Um, so in doing those, what are some of the things you need to think about when, when doing, doing the shots? Well, the first is, um, is light pollution. I think if you're in totality and you have a lot of light exposure in the sky, it, it can affect the, uh, how visible the moon appears or how bright it appears, how well you're able to see it. However, bear in mind, this was downtown Denver um, and it's, it's not, it's not like Manhattan, it's not super, super bright, it's not like London or places like that, um, but it's still plenty of light pollution going on there. If you want to get the best possible contrast in your shot of the, the totally eclipsed moon, let's say you were doing a single telephoto shot and you just want the moon, nothing else in it, try to find a dark sky, that, that'll definitely help you. Um, you can look at uh, light pollution in, in the web app, you can look at it in the iOS app. And you can see here, for example, that this spot in Hovenweep, as I mentioned, is in a super dark place. So be aware of light pollution. Uh, that, that's uh, generally speaking, uh, less light pollution is, is better for these things. Um, another consideration would be, oh, hold on. Let me just, I need to skip back to show you this light pollution thing. There we are. Hopefully you can all see that now. So that's the light pollution uh, with the pro sub. You can uh, enable that down here and get a sense of, of where there's lots and where there's less uh, light pollution. Um, if you are juxtaposing the moon with artificially lit objects, then you, a, a certain amount of light on them, say, say like that Denver shot with the state capital, a certain amount of light coming from it or shined onto it is fine. Too much and you might struggle to capture the, the moon. It may be, it may look a little bit weak or you may have to composite it afterwards or do a lot of post-production work to bring that out. Um, Focusing, one thing that I've I found, um, when you, if you're able to 
to really get your focus locked in before you get into total let's say your your, your composition is is static you're not going to move the camera too much which is probably the case with a, a wider angle uh, shot if you're able to get the focus locked in before it goes into totality that can be helpful because it the it can be very hard to see the the, the totally eclipsed moon it's it's low contrast some cameras may have trouble autofocusing on it um, and also if it's high in the sky you probably experienced this you're sat there and if you have the camera on a tripod and it's positioned up like this it it gets pretty uncomfortable pretty quickly to, to try to look through the, the viewfinder or indeed to look onto the live view screen unless you have one with an adjustable angle. So in this in those circumstances, if you've looked at it and the moon is going to be high in the sky, bring a chair, sit down so you can get underneath that camera and get, get focused um, more comfortably. Then finally, the, the one thing I wanted to talk about was um, for particularly a wide angle shot or and as especially as a sequence one of the things you need to think about is what is the the field of view that you might need uh, to capture the whole event and the whole event to my mind would mean um, some starting sometime before the beginning of partial eclipse and continuing through um, till after the end of partial eclipse and then you would see the moon go through all of its its various phases so one thing you probably want to think about for that just to if you're thinking through um, what equipment might I take and uh, which lens might be the best suited for, for this opportunity, you don't want to sort of change your mind halfway through. You need to have it, have made a decision and stick with it um, for the duration. You need to have a, a sense of what the field of view is. And so how can you do that? Well, one thing you can do, click on the start of partial event, look at the moon, check its I, I actually I'm going to go to a different location for this uh, because I I did the sums before to make it a little bit easier um, and here we are partial eclipse uh, this is Cape Canaveral down in Florida so the moon's out over the ocean and at the start of partial it's a azimuth of 134 and a half degrees so that's the bearing from true north 134 degrees it's this line here and then uh, I flick forward one day and go to the end of partial and it's at 190 degrees. So it's, it's, it's swept around past due south, um, ending up at 190 degrees. So that the difference between those gives you an angle um, and that's the horizontal angle through which the moon will move. Um, during the event and you take uh, 134 from 190 and you get a horizontal field of view of 55 56 degrees you can do the same for the, the height so let's quickly look at that um, at the start of partial the moon is 26 27 degrees above the horizon so that's the the vertical altitude and at the end of the event and the partial it's at 40 14 40 41 degrees so that's only a difference of 14 and a bit degrees. So that's, that's the vertical field of view. We've got 55, 56 for horizontal um, there and only sort of 14-ish for, for vertical. So that can give you a clue as to what sort of lens you, you might want to use. We have a, a, an iOS app called Photographer's Transit. There is a bunch of stuff online that will give you this data as well, but this, this is the app that we have for this. Um, it's a visual sort of field of view app. And here's the cameras dropped in Cape Canaveral. Um, I have a 35 mil SLR, so that's a, a full frame camera uh, and a, a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. And you can see here that I've, I've set the focal length to 34 millimeters. And if I click here on this thing, it shows you the field of view of what that lens and camera combination will be at 34 millimeters, it's giving me a horizontal field of view of 56 degrees. So that's just above what I need to accommodate the full path of the moon. And it's giving me a vertical field of view of 34 degrees, which is plenty more than, more than I'll need. But of course, it's not quite that simple. You need to go back and think, um, if I want the horizon in the shot, then I'm going from zero to 41, and in fact, I went to say this. In this example, the moon has passed through due south. 
which means it's gone through its highest point above the altitude. So that's what we should really look at. 41 degrees at transit. Transit is more or less approximately when the moon is at its highest. So bear in mind that the partial starts um, before transit, it goes through due south, its highest point, it starts descending again. So really the vertical field of view that we need, if we want to accommodate the horizon and the moon, is from zero, the horizon, to its highest altitude, which is 41 degrees. So you come back here and you go, well, actually, 34 is not going to cut it. And um, sorry, 30, 30, 39, that's what I've got here, the vertical field of view. 55 is just enough. 39 is not quite enough. So you know that you need to be wider than 34 mil to capture that full event with the horizon and the full sweep of the moon. You probably would give yourself, I don't know, at least five degrees either side in order to have some sort of ability to crop or fine tune or give some space um, visually to surround the path of the moon in, in your composite shot. So those were the considerations I had. What I'm going to do now in the last five minutes, just to come back to your questions. Um, so let's come back to Patricia's question. Uh, any advice on being able to capture the reflection of the eclipsed moon on a body of water? Um, I think the advice is that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence um, of light. So the light, you know, if it bounces in from an angle of 50 degrees, it bounces off at an angle of 50 degrees. So for you, now with water, it's never quite that simple because the, the surface moves and um, it's, it's bouncing off at various, you know, at every point on the path, the sight line between you um, and, and the, the, the horizon. Um, but to get that effect, the, the lower, there's an opt, I think there is some study on this where what, what is the optimal height of the moon above the horizon to sort of get that sort of long reflected light in the water. From memory, I think, Patricia, it's sort of around 10 to 20 degrees. It seems to work very well. People have done some of this study with regard to paintings as well and, and when, you know, what, what tends to reflect best. So a lower elevation, if, if the moon is way up at 50, 55 degrees above the horizon, that's harder. Um, if it's way down low on the horizon, two, three degrees, that's fine if it's a super clear night, no haze, and it's, and it's brighter, i.e. not in total eclipse. But otherwise, I imagine that could be harder to capture. I haven't tried it, so so I'd be fascinated to hear your experiences if, if you did. Um, John asks, uh, can one capture an image where the foreground element and the moon are both sharp? Uh, the answer is yes. It's to do with the hyperfocal distance, um, which is, uh, I think, to do with the, the sensor size, the... Uh, focal length, the aperture that, that you're using. Um, and that's assuming everything's stable. So that could depend on wind and camera mounting and um, shutter speed. But all those, assuming all of that is perfect, then really it's driven by what's the depth of field you can achieve um, at, at different distances from, from the sensor. So John, if you were to search for hyperfocal length, um, you'll undoubtedly find plenty of stuff online um, that will tell you about that. And that's uh, something that probably I'll type this term into the chat just so, uh, or hyperfocal distance, I think it is hyperfocal distance. But that's that's what you need to go, go read up about. Um, maybe that's something I'll get added into this uh, web app at some point. It will be, I think it could be quite handy. Um, what camera setting would you use for an astro eclipse dark sky? Yeah, um, Margaret asks, uh, so it depends on your camera. It depends on uh, it's how it handles noise. Um, generally speaking, uh, for total eclipse on a telephoto lens, you have a, a darkish object, the moon is dark. Um, the, uh, you've got a longer length lens, therefore you would want a shorter exposure. You can do that by widening your aperture, but don't widen it too far because then things get soft. Um, so on a 35 mil, probably don't go wider than 5.6, something like that. 
and increase your ISO um, to shorten your exposure time. Um, that, those are the, that's the, the you know the exposure triangle that you've probably seen before. But um, don't set it to you know necessarily set it to 3200 ISO unless you you have to. But not probably also no need to go down to 100 because that will force you to use a longer exposure time, which could make it harder to capture um, a sharp image. Uh, we are out of time, but I'm going to keep going for a few minutes because there's a bunch of questions. Um, Peter asks, when you say 300 mil, is that on a cropped sensor or a full frame? The Denver picture, the state capital one, Peter, which I think was the context I mentioned that in, I think that was on a crop frame, APC, whatever they're called, rather than full frame. The the other one um, with the eclipse moon setting over the, the sort of snowy um, landscape that was on a full frame at around 180 mil from memory. Um, yeah, Lyle asks about timing of shutter and movement of the moon. Um, that that's uh, actually that's that's another good consideration. You need to keep your exposure times down for the fact that the moon itself is is moving. Um, I probably should know what the what the exposure time would be, but I'm, I, I, you should be able to get something within I don't know a couple sub two seconds I think, um, and shorter is is better for for sure. Um, can you share the? Yeah, okay, let me do that. Um, Osman asks, what is the uh, the name of the app for the field of view? Um, let me just go to the website and I'll give you the link for that um, iOS and it's here there we are I'll put that link in the chat there we are okay yeah thank you Richard uh, Richard says his experience says the shutter needs to be a quarter of a second or less before movement is noticeable yeah that sounds sound advice to me um, let me have a look. Uh, Jill asked, I missed how you got to this photo information view. I'm, I'm guessing, Jill, you, you might be asking about, about this, this one that was in this, this other app that we have on iOS called uh, Photographer's Transit. So that's, uh, that's it. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, remember, if this eclipse does not work for you, uh, you can try this one in November. And hopefully that one will, will be visible in, in your part of the world. So thanks so much. Um, we'll do another webinar probably next month. Um, so I hope you're able to join. Thanks again for joining today. And don't forget, uh, survey if you can and drop us a line with any questions that I didn't get to today. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.